Last week, we went through quite a few suttas and we ended on a sutta or an excerpt from a sutta called Impurity and Purity. And that is on page 36 of this lovely book for anyone who has it or doesn't have it. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you don't have the book because I'm going to be reading from it. And the whole purpose is to try to apply these teachings to our own practice. So you don't need to follow every word. You don't even need to hold every word in mind. The Dhamma that will be helpful for you, you will naturally take in, you'll naturally absorb. That's just the way these things seem to work. So, okay, just seeing a few more hellos. So we started with, we ended with the sutta called Impurity and Purity. And that is from the Anguttara Nikaya 10, 176. So it's actually talking about, I think in that, in the Anguttara, it's called the 10 courses for wholesome action or something like that. And so we talked about um, these 10 being divided into three bodily actions, um, four verbal actions, and three mental actions. And last week we covered the three bodily actions. Shall I quickly go through it again for the sake of uh, our memories and for those who were not here? Yeah? Okay. So the Buddha says, how is impurity by body threefold? Here, someone destroys life. They are murderous, bloody handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. It's the first of three. Second, one takes what is not given. One steals the wealth and property of others in the village or the forest. Number three, one engages in sexual misconduct, has sexual relations with women who are protected by their father, mother, mother and father, brother, sister or relatives, who are protected by their dhamma, who have a husband, whose violation entails a penalty or even with one already engaged. It is in this way that impurity by body is threefold. So I'll go through the impurity of uh, speech, which is fourfold. Yeah? And how Chunda, and Chunda was a bhikkhu with the Buddha, is impurity by speech fourfold. Here, someone speaks falsehood. If they are summoned to a council, to an assembly, to their relative's presence, to their guild or to the court, and questioned as a witness thus, so good person, tell what you know. And then not knowing they say, I know, or knowing they say, I do not know. Not seeing they say, I see, or seeing they say, I do not see. Thus they consciously speak falsehood for their own ends or for another's ends, or for some trifling worldly end. So that's the first uh, wrong speech. So number two, one speaks divisively. Having heard something here, they repeat it elsewhere in order to divide those people from these. Or having heard something elsewhere, they repeat it to these people in order to divide them from those. Thus, they are one who divides those who are united, a creator of divisions, one who enjoys factions, rejoices in factions, delights in factions, a speaker of words that create factions. Then the third kind of wrong speech, one speaks harshly. One utters such words as are rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger and unconducive to stillness, samadhi. One indulges in idle chatter. One speaks at an improper time, speaks falsely, speaks what is unbeneficial, speaks contrary to the Dhamma and the discipline. At an improper time, they speak such words as a worthless, unreasonable, rambling, and unbeneficial. It is in this way that impurity by speech is fourfold. Okay, so there we've got killing, stealing, sexual misconduct by body, and then by speech, we've got basically lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and idle chatter or gossip, sometimes called gossip. So now we come on to impurity by mind. So this is page 37. So this is starting 
for the first time this week. Just checking you out. <laughs> I feel like we can't really start till I've seen everybody. You know, I feel like I need to know who's there, and then I feel like, yeah, somehow the dhamma flows out better that way. Good. So how chunda is impurity by mind threefold. Here, someone is full of covetousness. They long for the wealth and property of others. Thus. Oh, may what belongs to another be mine. Number two, they have a mind of ill will and intentions of hate thus. May these beings be slain, slaughtered, cut off, destroyed or annihilated. Number three, they hold wrong view and have an incorrect perspective thus. There is nothing given, nothing sacrificed nothing offered. There's no fruit or result of good and bad actions. There is no this world, no other world. That's about rebirth, right? There is no mother, no father. There are no beings spontaneously reborn. There are in the world no aesthetics and brahmins of right conduct and right practice, who, having realized this world and the other world for themselves, by direct knowledge, make them known to others. It is in this way that impurity of mind is threefold. So that completes the 10 courses of unwholesome karma. So they were the last three. And I want to just unpack it a little bit and just maybe have a look at how we can see some of these things in our own minds and maybe um, apply them in different ways. So the first one, is about wealth and property of others, right? Oh, may what belongs to another be mine. So I don't know if you've ever had that thought towards somebody who seems to have a lot in the physical world, in the material world. Personally, I've never been particularly materialistic. That's why I'm a monastic, <laughs> because I know that, you know, happiness doesn't come from that. And also I have to acknowledge the privilege of growing up fairly comfortable. So. I actually knew the kind of benefits, but also the limitations of that to some extent. And so I've never really felt that I need, um, even as much as my parents uh, have actually, to in order to be happy, but that happiness somehow comes from another place, from inside. Even in a very sort of happy childhood, I could still experience quite a lot of depression in my teens. Um, and mainly that was to do with not really having a sense of a meaning of why I was here. Um, and that meaning seemed to make all the difference to me personally when I found, you know, the Dhamma path. But I was thinking about this and I was thinking we might not think, hmm, may what belongs to another be mine in terms of wealth and property, or maybe we do. But sometimes we think of it in terms of maybe friends, right? Or... I wish I had the friend that this person has, like, oh, why can't I be in this particular group of people? You know? or, or you feel that perhaps you wonder why somebody who is uh, who you respect very much hangs out with somebody who you don't like very much. You might sort of think, oh, why is this person, you know, hanging out with them? They should hang out with me. <laughs> or, you know, oh, this teacher gives a lot of attention to this student. They should give more attention to me. <laughs> We can have this even for good things, for wholesome things. So it might be friends, it might be opportunities in life, yeah? Somebody's offered an opportunity that you would have liked to have. And we think, oh, sometimes we can just think, okay, I wish I had that opportunity. But but the covetousness is more like thinking that you want what that other person has. So there's a little bit of begrudging in a way, that person's fortune or success. And maybe we think they don't really deserve it and we're the ones that deserve it the most, you know? So this is kind of along the lines of envy, jealousy, covetousness. And um, classically, you know, in the Brahma Viharas, that's understood to be the opposite, the antithesis of um, what we call mudita, one of the Brahma Viharas, yeah, the third one. And one of the most difficult ones, actually, because it's fairly easy to develop feelings of goodwill towards people who are, you know, maybe a bit like you, they struggle, you can see their struggles. Um, 
you know, they don't bring up a sort of inferiority complex in you or, <laughs> you know, or feelings of jealousy, right? But can we still have that loving kindness towards people who have so much more, especially when we're struggling ourselves, you know? And actually learn to understand that it may appear that that person has more than we do or has a better situation than we do, but you really can't measure whether or not that translates into mental happiness for that person. People can have so much, you know, really so much, and yet be very, very unsatisfied, very unhappy. And in a way, I think the risk for unhappiness is even greater when you have a lot, because you've already kind of gone to the limits of what you can have materially. Maybe even you have the perfect family. But if there's still that sense of like emptiness in a negative sense, right? A sense of longing or a sense of not really knowing why you're here or what this life is for, it can be very, very distressing. And uh, I was in California in, um, when I was staying with, with the nuns in Aloka Vihara and uh, the train went through a particular part of San Francisco, which was the richest part of that city. Also the place where there were the most suicides from young people. You know, and they'd just jump into the train line. And they were the sons and daughters of the richest people, you know, in that city. And I just thought, perhaps they're rich materially, but I bet those children are devoid of time, quality time with their parents, you know. And perhaps there's so much pressure on them to achieve. Or perhaps they already feel like, what's the point? You know, we already have all this wealth, but still, that doesn't help. So sometimes we really don't know actually another person struggles. And I think for me, that's really helpful in um, undermining that tendency to envy or jealousy, covetousness. Also in the monastic sangha, there's this thing about, you know, you shouldn't look in one of the rules, one of the um, training guidelines I prefer is uh, not to look into another's arms bowl with covetousness. So you're not sort of sitting next to the monastic next to you and thinking, oh, they got the last uh, grapes or they got the last piece of chocolate cake or, oh, their bowl's really full. I could have put a bit more in my bowl. <laughs> yeah, this is covetousness. So you're not contented with what you have. You're comparing it with what someone else has. And that's a recipe, isn't it, for discontent? <laughs> so we have that and we take care to kind of look in our own bowl and be content and develop gratitude towards whatever's in front of us rather than like looking out and I'm sure that for lay people too right you're not eating in a bowl actually harder because you can see the food on the table and then you might be like oh I better hurry with this mouthful because there's seconds here you know and someone else might get to it first <laughs> actually my dad probably will maybe hear this but maybe not but my dad really has a good appetite I think all of us do and uh, as soon as I sort of get close to the end of my plate and I'd be struggling with the last bit my dad would be like have you finished then shall I finish that for you <laughs> I'd be like no get your hands off <laughs> in a very polite way <laughs> but yeah there was a bit of covetousness there for sure you know who can get the best sort of side of whatever you've cooked the crispy bits sorry it was meat in those days i'm talking about in my youth but uh yeah you want the best bit right you always want the best bit <laughs> anyway i won't continue to talk about that but um yeah the other thing that came to mind actually friends opportunities food we've got onto food but even meditation right can we feel sometimes this sense of covetousness towards someone else's meditation? You know, sometimes people generate that a lot towards monastics, actually. They say, oh, you're so lucky. You have an easy life, a simple life, lots and lots of time. Actually, it's sometimes not true. <laughs> I think personally for myself, I mean, I have far less time now than I did most of my life. But what I can say I have is an opportunity should conditions come together to kind of grab that opportunity because I don't have family, I don't have dependents in quite the same way. So even though right now my life is extremely busy putting together the foundations for you know what will become a future monastery, even on my days off, I, I find you know by six o'clock, I've just been going through emails and phone calls all day. 
<laughs> but the thing is I can still carve out time. Conditions do come together. For example, during the Rains retreat where I have like three months of opportunity for solitude. And this is really wonderful. But um, that doesn't mean that my meditation is deeper than maybe some of yours. We just don't know. We just can't compare, you know, various qualities we might be developing. Some of you might have strengths in areas that I'm still weak. I might have strengths in areas that, you know, you still need to develop. But the point is, it will all be developed over time. So, yes, even this covetousness towards another person's meditation can really be a hindrance because then we're never satisfied with that very simple moment that's just right in front of our mind. That's your moment, it's the one that's been given to you, that you have the opportunity to relate to kindly and wisely, yeah, and thereby make progress on the path. So that's about the covetousness. And... Um, the mind of ill will and intentions of hate. May these beings be slain, slaughtered, cut off, destroyed or annihilated. Sounds very, very severe, doesn't it? And yet we see that happening. We see that actually happening. And it starts, unfortunately, it starts in the mind. And I'm presuming no one here has kind of intentionally gone out to annihilate another human being, at least. But we may have had that thought towards creatures, little animals. Mm -hmm. We may have had that thought towards another human being also, but hopefully it stayed at the mental level. So this is talking about impurity of mind. And of course, we have to be very careful because whatever we plant in our mind tends to bear fruit, sometimes in verbal action that's very unskillful. And later on, if it becomes even stronger, more intense, and we don't manage to put the brakes on at the mental level, then it can leak over into very, very unskillful acts of body. And then the third one's quite interesting. It's about wrong view. And I like how here it says wrong view and incorrect perspective, because I think another translation for right view is right perspective, you know, getting a perspective on, on the situation. Not so much a view maybe, which seems a little bit more fixed, but more of getting things in their proper perspective. So understanding the scope, for example, of suffering, of dissatisfaction, yeah, that it is parinya tabam, it has to be fully understood. Basically it's pervasive. You know, and when we understand that scope of suffering, then we really have an incentive to take up these teachings and try to fulfill the path as far as we possibly can. And of course, part of that right perspective is uh, the compassion that ensues from realizing that we are all um, suffering in various ways. Even if you can't see that for yourself in your life, you know that you're subject to aging and death, and sickness. Everyone can catch COVID, right? It doesn't matter how old you are, where you live, how careful you are sometimes. I've met several people that say, I don't know how I got this, but I, I, you know, I'm really sick with COVID. I also know people who are quite young and really healthy and they've had long COVID, two people actually. Um, and they're really sick. You know, one of them's basically had to quit her job and she's in bed. This is five months after the infection. So we do, we are fragile. And I think it's very beautiful when that can transform into compassion. But the preliminary right view, as we spoke about in the first of these uh, sutta sessions, is that there's nothing given. Well, this is the opposite. This is the wrong view, right? There's nothing given, nothing sacrificed, nothing offered. And to me, that suggests a lack of gratitude. I mean, I think the main reason I'm feeling quite joyful from this COVID vaccine. I'm sure there's nothing special in the potion that they put in my arm. I don't know, <laughs> maybe there was, maybe they gave me the wrong injection. I was wondering that. <laughs> they gave me some sort of mellow amphetamine or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's the love in the jab. It's the love that's gone into these things, right? By all the scientists, the volunteers, the 
health workers that are disseminating these vaccines and just the blessing of realizing that it's not owed to me. I've actually done nothing to deserve the privilege of being one of the first, you know, we're in the top, like, I don't know, percentage of the world, but in England, 70% have been vaccinated. In other countries, it's like 0%. So what have I done to deserve that? Not very much. And so a feeling of gratitude arises because there are things given, sacrificed and offered. And our NHS have offered that to us for free. And when we talk about there being no fruit of or result of good or bad actions, then if you don't believe that the, it matters how you behave, then... Why should you develop a sense of moral conscience, a sense of moral caution? My preferred uh, translation for hiri or tapa, sometimes translated as moral shame and moral dread. I tend to think of those as like having a conscience, you know, that your actions are going to ensue in results. It's going to affect other people. It's going to also affect your mind. And this is the beautiful thing about meditation. We actually start to see how our mental behavior affects our mind almost instantly, right? You have a thought which is a little bit stingy or ungrateful and you just feel grumpy. <laughs> Your whole energy, sort of energetic body, if you like, is kind of compressed and, and sort of deflated, contracted. And then when you can connect with that feeling of gratitude and the feeling that, yeah, whatever I do coming from goodness coming from goodwill it actually feels good it feels right you know it feels like yes this is living up to my potential to my value system and we feel good so we get that instant uh, result of our skillful mental action so it's in this way by having um a lack of right view in this context that impurity by mind is threefold. So our minds are um, defiled, if you like, made impure through covetousness, through hate, and in this case, through wrong view. So I'd like to pause there and see if there are any comments, questions, or even complaints. <laughs> By which I mean, that's just Ajahn Brown's little thing, comments, questions, and complaints, but I like it because you don't always have to agree. So whoever's doing the questions will mention your name and they will unmute you. I will ask Leah to unmute. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, well done on the vaccine. Thank you. But it wasn't me. <laughs> well, I mean, you turned up, you know. It's not, true. Yeah, so, you know, so you did well. Thank <laughs> you. <not> well. <laughs> true. Um, so, um, my question was about covetousness. Um, mm. So that was like, <laughs> that's a bit of a tongue twister for me. But um, the question was, you were, t you were talking about if somebody's having um, more food than you. What if it's a question of justice like of mm. you know equal opportunity or equal mm. sharing do you know what I mean yeah yeah I think the motivation is very different <laughs> so I don't know that that would be covetousness I mean if somebody's actually hungry that's like a natural instinct to eat and if you actually have a sense of yeah injustice and you want to work for more justice in the world then I mean, sometimes there can be quite a bit of anger tied up in that. But if we're able to process our anger and see the beauty that, you know, underneath it, sometimes anger can show us what our value systems really are. And so I think if you can, like, get underneath the anger, so to speak, and actually tap into the wholesome part of that intention, that wish for justice, then you release the sort of more negative emotion that can drain your energy and then something more akin to compassion can arise. And so when that compassion arises, it's actually a beautiful motivation and that will give you energy to work towards justice. So that's absolutely, you know, totally um, important and, and um, encouraged by the Buddha, right? He says that not only should we abstain from various things, we should also encourage others to do that and also praise others 
in that. So in the same way, we should, uh, you know, not only perform wholesome action, but we should encourage others to perform wholesome action and we should speak in praise of wholesome action. So this path is not just about, well, it's not actually <laughs> really just about um, stopping the unwholesome action. It's also cultivating uh, the wholesome as well. And that can take so many different forms. You know, it's not that everybody's going to be like a climate activist or I don't know, a vegan activist or um, a Dhamma teacher or a mindfulness teacher or whatever other ways you have, whatever, whatever gifts you have, um, to share with the world you know we're all different um, but I think it's more about just seeing where we can help um, how we can purify our motivation keep resourced and then put our energies to good use so that's some thought any follow-up on that All good. So. Thank you to Jane. Hi. Hi, well, Jane. Just, hello. Hi. I just wondered if you had any tips on um, covetousness in a more, because um, I'll tell you what I find uh -huh. is not not really in big things, but lots and lots of little ways. Um, so, for example, the houses, this is true, right? This is a big confession. The houses on the other side of the road where I live have a better view than my side of the road. Yeah. Isn't it ridiculous? And so often I find myself just thinking, huh. And it is that thing. It's like, huh. Yeah. How come? How come they have a better view? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's such a confession because it, it sounds so pathetic. And no, so, it sounds very human. <laughs> I, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I want to mm. get rid of it, but I don't uh -huh. know. How to get rid of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think for me in the practice, um, the first day, step in sort of contacting emotions that I know cause suffering for myself is to learn to meet them, first of all before wanting to get rid of them because we don't actually have to get rid of things all we have to really do is bring our awareness to them and that awareness itself um, seems to do most of the work so you've already done the first step you know it's there that's step number one. Second thing is you know it's causing you suffering and as soon as the mind knows that and really understands that it will naturally start to let go of it you'll become more and more attuned to the way that's just, yeah, in a way, um, what's the word? Not, not spoiling your mind, but kind of like taking away the contentment that you may otherwise find in your own situation. And the more you see that, it's like the mind will start to say, oh, okay, all right, yeah, that's true. Like, I'll just stop that now. <laughs> but it takes time. Um, I mean, for me, the most effective way really in my practice life with um, overcoming hindrances of covetousness or any of those sort of unwholesome reactions that cause suffering is by being really connected to my physical sensations because I can feel instantly the effect it has on, in my body and mind. When you can feel it in your body, it brings you closer to your mental field because the mental field can be quite abstract in a way but the body sensations are always related to that mental realm and they become for me easier to work with because I can feel them arising and I can feel the kind of contraction or whatever it might be or like maybe some fluttering in your tummy if something's making you anxious and you can just be with that and like open your heart to it in a sense and also see that it's arising and passing so there's already, by bringing that awareness, you're much less likely to react to those feelings. And it just starts to happen over time that you find the reactions are, have less and less force in them. Even if you react, they tend to dissolve much more quickly. So that is one way, just to be you know, really present with those feelings and, and just realize it makes you suffer. <laughs> 
I mean, on the other hand, because I'm very moderate sort of person, I would also say like, I mean, maybe there's something in that, I don't know how much of it is just covetousness that's an unwholesome habit, but maybe there could be something in that that's telling you that actually I would like to live with a really beautiful view and that it would be really helpful for you and it would give you a feeling of like spaciousness or inspiration and you know sometimes it can be that as well so instead of going into covetousness we can just say oh we can more turn it into inspiration oh I like what they've got let me also see if I can work hard and give myself that if it's really important to you so maybe differentiating between what's just like a sort of knee-jerk reaction of jealousy and what's actually really important to you yeah. <laughs> uh, well unmute Janaki um Linda Bachanda, yes. Uh, I think um, I don't know. I may be right or wrong, <laughs> but I think um, to be rid of covetousness um, is, you know, to be to become um, uh, to be satisfied with what you have, or um, and uh, you you have very little uh, desires, or you are not desiring for, to have more and more and more because there is no it will be an endless thing yes yeah. so, yeah to be satisfied with what you have what little yeah have. yeah definitely definitely that's I think the antidote I mean sometimes covetousness it falls in the category of greed right craving wanting greed and I do think one of the most um if not the most effective antidotes to that particular defilement or hindrance in meditation is contentment you know because if you're content with what you have <laughs> genuinely content like really value it really appreciate it then why should you want anything else you know it was happening to me during my rains last year rains is like the three month uh, retreat that monastics do in the rainy season in Asia over here it was summer but I had to stay here rather than go to Perth and it's the first time I've had to do that in many many years I spent about eight rains over there and suddenly I was all on my own in England you know and I could see that from time to time this thought would come up it was almost just a conditioned thought like oh they must be having a better time over there like imagine if I was in the forest and then straight away another thought would come which was great and it was like but I'm fine here. I'm really content. I've got so much, you know, in a way it was almost like a miracle that I could do it here because I was being fed. I mean, we had to devise a whole system by which I could be fed without having visitors stay, you know? Um, and the fact that the rent was being covered by the charity and I was safe, you know, I had access to parks and I was, uh, you know, not at risk of getting covid and my family and everyone was safe so i actually had a lot to be contented about and sometimes we just have to notice that and that's really a powerful way to undermine that habit of covetousness so yeah definitely i mean part of the gradual training is um sort of immediately after virtue as a part of virtue in the suttas um is contentment and simplicity yeah and it's also a part of metta. One who is ready for loving kindness is someone who's um, not proud or demanding in nature, contented and easily satisfied. That's a part of loving kindness as well. It's very beautiful. Thank you for that. Anything else before we move on? We back down to uh, <laughs> one paragraph now. <laughs> <laughs> we had a few sessions where we did a few pages today it's one paragraph <laughs> one more before i move on yes i will unmute now thank you kelly um hi venerable chanda i really hi. enjoyed hi yeah i really enjoyed this this focusing on covetousness um i have one question um, if the instant first thought is one of covetousness and it takes yeah. a little bit of what of processing and reasoning to kind of see where that's coming from, 
does that make you a bad person because your first thought is like I mean I know that's I know as I say it that's not right but do you know what you know what I'm trying to say it feels it feels wrong when we spend so much time working on trying to do things the right way um and yet the instinct is still not the most helpful thought yeah 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 absolutely and this is why we're training on the path you know I mean at a deeper level you're not going to be free from covetousness or at least greed as a full you know as the full thing um, of which this is a part of um, or aversion or delusion until you're actually um, on the third stage of enlightenment which is a very very high stage on the path so I think to be really easy and understanding with yourself that it's not a reflection of you as a person, it's a reflection of where you are in the training. And that is quite an impersonal thing. You know, it's a path. So we start walking on it. And as we walk, we proceed. That's all. It's not that this person is like that or the other person is like this. It's just these are the um, contents of the mind. These are the um, habits, the condition programs that are in the mind. And it's really wonderful to be able to see that with honesty. And that actually makes you a person, not a bad person, but a person on the path. And that's really the difference, I think, with people who have come into contact with the Dhamma and those who are still very confused about all of that and trying to find justification for that outside. You know, of course, we immediately think it's to do with outside because we're not enlightened yet. But then we, come inside and have a look at what's going on in our mind and that's where you know the transformation can really start to happen and uh towards the end of this uh section i did want to yeah the very end of this part which we may or may not get to today um it talks about the opposite of those 10 courses for unwholesome karma and it talks about the 10 courses of wholesome karma And at the end, it says that the outcome of those, that we're going to be reborn in the Deva realm or the human being realm or any other good destination. So I think it's important to notice that we are human beings. So that must mean that, generally speaking, we've been practicing the 10 wholesome courses of karma. So I think it's also, again, about those two bad bricks, you know, Ajahn Brahm's story. Yeah, of course, there are traces of all of these things in us. Some may be stronger than others. Some, you know, we might have more of one at some time in our life or on some days even than we do on other days. Um, But generally speaking, we must be doing okay because we had a human birth. So we're definitely on the side of the 10 courses of wholesome karma, I would say. Okay. So, I'd quite like to continue. So now it's going into the opposite, and this should be quite easy to digest because it is just straight out opposite. But see how it affects your mind when I read the opposites? Because I noticed when I was reading it earlier that um, when you're reading the kind of unwholesome things, you know, you're reading like words that are kind of not very pleasant, not very inspirational, right? like annihilating beings. It's like it has a heavy, heavy energy. But when we read the opposite, there's something extremely light and freeing about it. Just see if you can sense that in your body as you listen. So the little middle bit here, the joining bit, these chunda are the 10 courses of unwholesome karma. It is because people engage in these 10 courses of unwholesome karma that hell, the animal realm, the sphere of afflicted spirits, and any other bad destinations are seen. So here it's saying engaging in these, right? Engaging. I think that's different from just having them come up from time to time. It's like actively engaging in these things, cultivating them if you like. Okay, so now we get onto the opposites. Purity by body, Chunda, is threefold. Purity by speech is fourfold. (laughs) And purity by mind is threefold. It's a maths lesson. (laughs) And how, Chunda, is purity by body threefold? Here, someone having abandoned the destruction of life abstains from the destruction of life. With rod and weapon laid aside, 
conscientious and kindly. They dwell compassionate towards all living beings. Now that's more than just not killing, isn't it? It's really beautiful. Conscientious and kindly dwells with compassion toward all living beings. Number two, having abandoned the taking of what is not given, one abstains from taking what is not given. One does not steal the wealth and property of others in the village or in the forest. I'm sure most of you are doing both of these pretty well. Number three, having abandoned sexual misconduct, one abstains from sexual misconduct. One does not have sexual relationships with women or men or transgender people or non-binary people who are protected by their father, mother, mother and father, brother, sister or relatives who are protected by their Dhamma, which means kind of their religion in this context, I think, their particular code of conduct that, you know, which guides their life or who have a husband or wife or spouse, let's say and whose violation entails a penalty or even with one already engaged. It is in this way that your body is threefold. So most of you are not killing, not uh, stealing and hopefully not having any kind of adultery or cheating on your partner. So that's very good. And if you are, then please stop and ask forgiveness. <laughs> You can always be forgiven, that's the good thing. <laughs> I mean, it really makes me laugh. <laughs> it's very sweet that, that you find that funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how, Chanda, is purity by speech fourfold? So here we have the opposite of the wrong types of speech, which is also very lovely. Here, someone has abandoned false speech abstains from false speech. If they're summoned to a council, to an assembly, to their relative's presence, to their guild or to the court, and questions as a witness thus, so good person, tell what you know. And then not knowing, they say, I do not know. Or knowing, they say, I know. Not seeing, they say, I do not see. And seeing, they say, I see. They have congruence. Right? They're trustworthy. Thus, they do not consciously speak falsehood for their own ends or for another's ends or for some trifling worldly end. I like that phrase, trifling worldly end, you know, because what's really worth breaking your precepts over is probably only something very superficial, very mundane, most of the time, most of the time. And I wonder how many times we've all done that, you know, for trifling worldly ends, we've just bent the truth or pretended we didn't see something we saw. <laughs> and did it really work? You know, did you really get the reward of that? Could there be any reward of that? There is one exception I thought of mentioning, actually, because, um, I mean, for me personally, I think speech and particularly being honest is something that is very, very it's one of my strengths and it's close to my heart. Like I'm, I'm pretty honest, too honest sometimes. <laughs> it's, uh, and so I would normally say, you know, there's no instance ever where we should lie or, you know, we should always be true because if you can't be true to your experience, to the reality, how can you walk the path of truth? I mean, we're moving from grosser truth to the subtlest of truths. And so truth is such an important part of the path. But there is this lovely story that Ajahn Brahm tells as a kind of exception to this, and this is extreme. And you can see here that the motivation would be completely different, completely different. So it's just not to say that it would be good karma, but just to say that karma is not black and white. But in this particular case, there were um, two men in hospital, real people. I don't know who they are, but um, it's a story of people, I guess, that Ajahn Brahm knows. Um, and they were both in hospital with a similar heart condition, which was very serious, waiting for their operation. 
And uh, while they were there, they were on the ward for a while, you know, undergoing all the tests and stuff. And they became really, really good friends. They really hit it off. And maybe they were a similar age in their life. And they just really bonded, you know, being alone there for so long. And uh, both of them were pretty anxious about the operation coming up, but one of them had to go first. And so he went in there first for the operation, which was a very complicated one. And, um, you know, the other man who was waiting behind was not only concerned for himself, but concerned for his very dear friend, you know, who, who was now so close to him and they'd shared all about each other's life stories and the rest. And, uh, and so he went in for his operation and then a couple of days later, the wife of the man who was still waiting for his came back and uh, and her husband said, oh, you know, it's my turn to go in soon and I'm hoping my friend's done okay. Is he fine? You know, is he recovering well? And his wife said, yeah, he's fine. Because actually he died on the operating table in this very complicated surgery. And she just knew that that would really devastate him, not only because of the personal loss, but also it would give him that anxiety and fear, you know, it would increase that anxiety and fear in himself when going in for the operation. So that is an example. And apparently he went in for the operation. And again, it was very, very difficult, very, very close. And he almost didn't pull through, you know, and, and who knows? if he had gone in with that extra anxiety, extra concern, and also the grief, the shock, who knows if he would have made it. And so in that kind of case, you know, she took a kind of calculated decision that that wasn't the right time to tell him the truth. I'm sure that later on he came to know, but not at that time. So I kind of like that story, although it's a little bit of a dangerous one because we might be able to manipulate it to say, well, it was really important for me too to sort of just bend it a bit and save that person's feelings. But what I find with this kind of thing is that often we're just saving our own feelings. Um, my first teacher actually in Nepal, he was called Madame Toledo. He's actually died now, but he was one of my first teachers. My first teacher, my very first personal teacher. He said to me, um, in the West peoples, this is a generalization, but he said in the general, what he's noticed amongst Western uh, students who come to those retreats is that our weakness in the five precepts tends to be sexual misconduct. Perhaps also because they were looking at it through the eyes of like, you're either celibate or you're committed for life. So they see that as our weakness, you know, culturally, and, and maybe it is greed, craving, lust. And he said, but for the Nepalis anyway, I think our hardest one, our weakness is right speech. You know, it's too easy to sort of tell a half truth or just lie and we don't really see it as lying. <laughs> so that tends to be our weakness and Westerners tend to be, this is very general, right? And of course, many people, Nepalis are also Westerners if they've lived in the West, right? So I'm not trying to say that one type of person is like sort of a fixed entity. But um, just very generally, he noticed that um, sort of white lies and fibs were more common among people that he'd grown up with. And he asked me, you know, why do people lie? He, he put me on the spot. And I thought about it from the perspective of Vipassana practice, you know, about sensations that we're always trying to react to or get away from or crave for. And he said, it's always to avoid an unpleasant sensation. And again, it does come back down to that. You know, it does. It's like how things make us feel. We're not really responding to the outside situation, but we're worried. We're reacting to how it's going to make us feel. If we tell the truth, it's going to feel, ooh. you know, especially if you've got to make a confession that's, I mean, somebody today already was very brave. And I mean, it's nothing, you know, because we all have it. And it can be quite a relief just to say, yeah, sometimes I'm envious of people, other people's hairs. It can be quite a relief, right? And it's a very beautiful thing because you're being honest, you're being true. And uh, yeah, you can feel a bit like skin crawling at the time, you know, especially if you have to make a, a real confession, say in the monastic sangha, and you're thinking, gosh, what will people think of me? You know, it can be difficult, but the feeling afterwards is wonderful because I think it's always much more beautiful, much more, it's a different kind of pleasure you might have to deal with superficial displeasure, but the kind of deeper happiness, the happiness of virtue, is something more stable and more reliable that starts to grow from within. 
And I think it gives you a sense of confidence and sort of integrity, just to be honest to your experience, right? Even if it's hard to admit. So that was about speech, the speech of being honest and truthful. You can see it's almost like language that they'd use in court, isn't it? You ask, did you see this? And you've got to say, if you saw it, yes, I saw this. You can see how the course of justice gets perverted when that doesn't happen. So the next one, number two wrongs, oh, right speech in this case. So this is the purity of speech. So the second one, having abandoned divisive speech, one abstains from divisive speech. Having heard something here, they do not repeat it elsewhere in order to divide those people from these. Or having heard something elsewhere, they do not repeat it to these people in order to divide them from those. And here comes the nice bit. Thus, one is one who unite, reunites those who are divided, is a promoter of unity, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, and is a speaker of words that promote concord. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> so number three. Having abandoned harsh speech, one abstains from harsh speech. That's a real tongue twister, harsh speech. <laughs> they speak such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Mm. I heard a beautiful talk by Ajahn Brahm today on Dhammaloka. And even without the actual content of the words, his words were so soft and so peaceful. I was really like, oh, this is so calming for the mind. It's just so lovely sometimes to hear somebody speak such words. And there was no uh, audience because they've got like one case of COVID. <laughs> when they get one case, they look down for a few days so they can trace all the contacts. So they really kept it under control. So because of that, there was no one in the room. And Ajahn was just closing his eyes and just speaking from you know a deep place, very softly, very relaxed. And he said sometimes, you know, when he's talking, most of the time, and same for me, you're sort of connecting with the energy in the room, and it's not really, it's sort of coming from you, but it's things come in a way that you're not really calculating them to. It's it seems to be more tuned up really to the people who are there. Whether successfully or not, I don't know. But um, he said, you know, since there isn't anybody, it has the advantage in one sense of um, meaning that he can just speak whatever comes to his mind for himself, you know, like from the heart. And it was really lovely. I could definitely say it was lovable. It went to the heart. Desired by many. Words that are desired by many. Like you want to listen to the Dhamma, right? That's a wholesome desire. And agreeable to many can't really argue with non-violence right it's quite agreeable I would say it's like something in the human heart knows yeah that's right that's that's how we should be as human beings and the last one number four having abandoned idle chatter one abstains from idle chatter one speaks at a proper time speaks truth speaks what is beneficial speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At a proper time, one speaks such words that are worth recording, reasonable, succinct, and beneficial. It is in this way that purity by speech is fourfold. Very lovely. I'm tempted to keep reading through, so we finish this paragraph. Shall I do that? And then we can have just a few more comments at the end. Before I do that, I just want to highlight that throughout all of these um, more positive ones, there are two main words that are discussed. And they are that they have abandoned the unwholesome and that they abstain from the unwholesome. I just think those two words are beautiful, abandoned. I think that's pah uh, pahana, most probably like having abandoned something unwholesome. Doesn't it sound lovely? Just the word abandoned sounds like freeing, freeing the mind, you know, just abandon all that baggage, all that garbage. 
and that abstaining it's a little bit more like a training perhaps a bit more like restraint sense restraint guarding the mind protecting the mind so the last one how, Chunda, is purity by mind threefold? Here, someone is without covetousness. One does not long for the wealth and property of others. Thus, oh, may what belongs to another be mine. So, of course, that also could go into actually feeling happy for somebody else and even rejoicing in another person's gain. That's the uh, more positive side of mudita. Number two, they are benevolent. So this is the opposite of the hate, okay? They are benevolent and their intentions are free of hate thus. May these beings live happily, free from enmity, affliction and anxiety. You know, sometimes when you see horrific things happening in the world, sometimes we might think, yeah, these people should be restrained. These people should suffer for their bad deeds. They should at least go to prison even if you're not as violent mentally as wanting them to die, I hope not. Um, but often we still think we want to punish these people and that's our main motive, isn't it? I mean, of course, justice is important, but imagine if we could have that thought, may they live happily, free from enmity, affliction and anxiety. And I often think of that, try to cultivate those thoughts toward people like the military dictators or those people conscripted a often against their will into the army in Burma or toward, you know, corrupt politicians who are not disseminating oxygen to the people who need it, you know, who have fundamentalist views, anti-Muslim views, whatever kind of anti-views, hateful views. Sometimes we can pick up on that anger almost and it starts to boil up inside us too. But really those people are behaving that way because they are afflicted. They are full of anxiety or fear. They are full of enmity. So this is very beautiful to wish them freedom from those things. That's the real cure. That's the cure at the deeper level. Because we can only inflict harm on others when we're coming from a mind of hate. And the third one, one holds right view and has a correct perspective thus. There is what is given, sacrificed and offered. There is fruit, not fruit on the tree, but there is fruit on the tree as well. <laughs> it just looks funny seeing the word fruit. And result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings spontaneously reborn, or at least there might be. You might not believe that, but you could be open to that possibility. There are in the world ascetics and Brahmins of right conduct and right practice who, having realized this world and the other world for themselves by direct knowledge, make them known to others. It is in this way that purity by mind is threefold. So again here, when we have the right view, there is what is given, sacrificed and offered. That's a sense of gratitude. There is the fruit and result of good and bad actions. So we have a sense of moral conscience. We also have some wisdom to discern the difference, right? We need wisdom to discern what good and bad actions are and what the effects of them it may be. There is this world and the other world. So there's at least here a provisional understanding of rebirth. I don't see how else you could interpret that. There is mother and father. There are beings spontaneously reborn, aesthetics and Brahmins of right conduct. So this also engenders feelings of gratitude and feelings of confidence, right? If you really understand that there are people who've made an end to suffering, you know, they have right conduct and right practice and they teach others. That can lead to a tremendous amount of confidence and inspiration. And Ajahn Brahm also says the point of listing these types of beings is because these are the fields of merit Right? If we perform wholesome actions directed toward our mother and father, directed toward good monastics, good people on the spiritual path, then they're going to result in many, many benefits for ourselves and others. Yeah.
And in this way, the purity of the mind is threefold. And as we um, discussed in one of the first sessions, this right view also brings into play right effort, the sixth factor of the path, and also, or right endeavor, and also right sati, right mindfulness. And I just want to go back to that because it's really nice the way it's explained here. So first we have that right view, at least at the preliminary level. And then in uh, this particular sutta on the first page, actually, page 17 of the book, it's from Majjhima Nikaya 117. It says that one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and enter upon right view. And that is one's right effort. Yeah, so we try to align our views or our perspectives in ways that actually um, bring us closer to an understanding of the Dhamma and bring us out of suffering. And by doing that, that is one's right effort. That is one way of interpreting what right effort is. And then it says, mindfully one abandons wrong view and mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. And this is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view, that is, right view, right effort or endeavor, and right mindfulness, samasati. So it's so wonderful that we can take a piece of the practice and it always includes so many other factors of the path. They don't really stand alone. So how are we doing with that sutta? There's one more uh, sentence, <laughs> just, to sum, just to conclude. These chunda are the 10 courses of wholesome karma. It is because people engage in these 10 courses of wholesome karma that the devas, human beings, and any other good destinations are discerned. So we did okay so far to get a human life. So the fact that you're practicing the Dhamma in this life, I would imagine would mean that you're well on track to another human birth or a birth in the Devalokas or any other good destinations. And I think it's good to be positive because that increases the wholesome qualities in our mind and thus increases our chances, right? Of, uh, of moving from suffering to happiness, from darkness to brightness. So that was the Anguttara Nikaya 10176. So we've pretty much run out of time because somehow I spoke quite a lot today. Some days there's more discussion, some days there's more Chandar discussion. <laughs> but uh, if there's one more comment perhaps to end, anything that someone has that's really you know, important to them or anything that needs to be clarified or just something you'd like to share. I'll, I'll take one comment or question. Someone's written something here. Regarding false speech, we recently had to report an armed man with a sword and crossbow, but although we were frightened and wanted him to be arrested for our own safety, had to make clear to the police that he was not threatening us. He was then released next day. We wish for him to receive the help he may need, not punishment, as he's maybe full of fear and suffering himself. Yeah, beautiful, absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, sounds very strange. I mean, you wonder in these sort of cases, sometimes it might be anger and, and aversion, but a lot of the time it could be delusion. You know, maybe he's gone slightly mad. And the Buddha said, actually, that a person with anger is like a sick person, right? Like a sick person who's maybe physically sick or maybe mentally sick. So that's really true. Yeah, it sounds like you struck the right balance there with protecting yourselves and him and also not bringing about undue punishment. Yeah. I just hope that people do have access to mental health care, you know, because I think for me, that's one of the biggest worries as a longer term outcome of this pandemic. It's like, how are people going to show up now? Having had so much isolation, you know, it's like a sort of low grade ongoing trauma I think for many of us, even those who haven't lost people, it's been very, uh, put a lot of people on the edge. Yeah. 
even people I know who are like meditation teachers, they've some some of them have gone through like some of the darkest times of their lives because it is just so. It's like when when the foundations of your life just turn to jelly, isn't it? <laughs> what you thought was kind of predictable and you know solid suddenly looks very shaky indeed. So yes, thank you for that comment. That's really a great example. And uh, we've nearly finished. So what I think I'll do is invite whoever is giving the little Dana talk and then I have some homework for you, but it's not intellectual, it's nice homework. So please do stay. <laughs> and I also tell you about next week's uh, uh, day retreat. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, normally we um, point out the Anukampa project and we point out the Anukampa project, of course, um, and ask for donations if you liked the session. Today, Venerable Chanda would like to consider to make a donation to the Coronavirus Relief Fund which is a sort of crowdfunding uh, in support of um, India, which, which is a country which is in a serious uh, situation with the coronavirus. Uh, the link is in the chat box. It is uh, covid19.ketro.org. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, yeah. I had actually, uh, yeah really hoped that we could do a little something for the people in India today and had intended actually to um, just make the point that all these teachings are the inheritance of India, right? The Buddha is always born in India. All the Buddhas apparently are born in India. It's a land of enormous wisdom and experimentation, you know, to find the end of samsara, the end of suffering. And that culture still has that same kind of spiritual um, fervor and sense of a search. That's the land where I actually contacted the Dhamma and I spent many, many years practicing and serving all kinds of people. You know, I even served a retreat once with Jain monks and nuns who were walking across India just with their white um, robes and their sort of brushes. And they were like, they were ascetics and they came to this retreat in a, I think it was an eye hospital somewhere in Koch a very remote part of Gujarat and uh, yeah I used to serve in Damagiri which is the main Goenka centre uh, in a town called Igatpuri and uh, there'd be 500 people on each retreat 500 from every possible walk of life you know you had women from villages where they had they were totally illiterate and sometimes they just walked there or borrowed enough train fare to get onto that retreat everything all offered on a donation basis so no one was left out and then there'd be like rich business people from the city you know and foreigners from all over the world I mean I used to play Russian discourses to one group we had an Iranian group we used to play the Iranian discourses to them <laughs> uh, there were westerners living there you know German people fluent in Hindi I was there for a year myself uh, studying some Pali, but mainly serving on those retreats. So it's really an incredible place. And uh, unfortunately, the infrastructure and the government is pretty uh, corrupt. I think, you know, apparently only 1.3% of the gross, whatever they call it, whatever money is available to the government, they only spend about 1.3% on health care which is far less than most other countries at that sort of standard of living in the world. And some reports say it's far less because they're counting things that don't really come under like primary care. So yeah, keeping the Indian people in our hearts. And if anybody is um, willing to support or wants to make a donation, then I just ask that you consider making it to this organization. There may be other organizations that you've heard of that you rely on and trust. That's also great. Um, but for the sake of the recording, it's uh, covid19.kato, K-E-T-T-O dot org. Okay, covid19.k-e-t-t-o dot org. And I think they have people in India and also take donations from overseas. 
and can deliver it to places where oxygen is needed. That's the main thing, oxygen, provisions and food. So wonderful. Thank you very much. And I promised some homework, didn't I? I promised some homework. So your homework is to not worry too much about scrutinizing wrong speech or anything like that, but to try to conscientiously find ways of bringing in some of these beautiful speeches in your everyday life. So that is the uh, way, the four courses of, what does it call it? Purity of speech, is that right? Purity of speech, the fourfold purity of speech. So looking at the positive there, saying, you see what you actually see, right? Not saying you don't see what you uh, see and vice versa. And then these words that reunite, that bring concord, let's try and speak in those ways. It doesn't always mean you have to say positive things about people. Sometimes you might have to discuss things that are difficult, but you do it with the intention for greater understanding and to bring about um, a right way of relating to that person a more sensitive way maybe or a more skillful way so that your ultimate aim is to promote concord and words that are gentle pleasing and lovable that go to the heart sometimes we could say more to encourage each other or to point out our qualities or another excuse me another person's qualities to them or to another hmm? but we're a bit stingy in that way it might be like not very cultural in the case of Britain. <laughs> I had a long conversation with a friend yesterday about that. Because uh, even my own teacher, he very rarely says really positive things. He'll just say, oh, yeah. Like if I say, oh, I'm wasting your time, he'll say, that's rubbish. But he won't actually say the positive aspect. And my friend said, that's quite cultural actually. Especially, I don't know if that's really true, but a certain generation and maybe, yeah. I won't say more than that, <laughs> but you know we can we can change that. We can uh, just see what it does, see how it lights people up, and maybe makes you feel good as well. Words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable go to the heart. Are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. So you know you don't have to say anything amazing, but just yeah. And then speaking at the proper time, not wasting people's time, right? reasonable, succinct and beneficial. So in order to be succinct and reasonable, I will end here. <laughs> so thank you, I enjoyed that and I hope you enjoyed that and I was glad that I eventually could arrive. Thanks for waiting for me. <laughs> and thanks to the team who had a few um, hair raising moments. <laughs> <laughs> where they thought they might have to read the book but if that ever happens just just you know just read a few paragraphs then ask if there's any comments you can do it you can do it as a team I'm sure there's no right or wrong answer about these things so good so our usual pattern now is to unmute people if you wish you can wave goodbye and say goodbye bye